don't know if anybody's heard of it or if any of you guys have really coded in SAS much, but it's an open source project from SAS that they started. It's only like a year, year and a half old. And the fact that SAS is willing to do an open source project kind of baffles me a little bit because that is not like their usual trade. Has anybody in here actually used SAS before? So it's usually an incredibly expensive program. It's like $10,000 for a regular base SAS license for the first year, and it's like three grand every year after that. So it's pretty expensive, but I mean, it's an incredibly robust framework. I mean, they, it's existed for a long time, but they really haven't broken into the open source market. They realized that Python was something a lot of people were looking into, especially for connecting to different APIs. So they started this project, and so it uses SAS in Python scripts which I thought was really cool. And you can use SAS and Python to actually access data from HTTPS websites. And so I'm actually gonna show you guys the program um, because there's different features it has. It actually has a, a mode where you called teach me SAS. And so whenever you write Python code and you submit it, it actually shows you the equivalent SAS code to it one-to-one. -one. And so, you know, if you look at like the programming languages and where, where the industry is going, a lot of it's a mixed bag between where people use SAS and Python, SAS and R, but SAS is usually kind of always involved. So this is really great in, in case anybody wants to break out of, you know, just Python and learn SAS. And so they actually have a free way to do this. So I was gonna show you. I was playing with this for most of the, for like a month. It's been pretty fun actually. So has anybody heard of SAS University Edition? So there's actually a free version of SAS available that you can download now. And it, you know, it runs locally and you just load it up in your browser, but it enables you to run SAS code. And so, you know, it has Jupyter Notebook. It just integrated that, I think, back at the end of December or so. So it's fairly new. And so when you, you know, you can start Jupyter Notebook and there's a bunch of examples. And so here we'll start with, you know, just importing. So, you know, I import SASPy, import pandas as well. And then I tell it like kind of, I tell it to start the SAS session. And so in this respect, you just tell it, you know, I just want to start a default session because you're running university edition. And so it should run, tells you how it works. Do what? Zoom. Is that better? Okay. And so SAS has a lot of useful kind of data sets that you can use. Now, these are really clean, by the way. These are not like your atypical like data sets you get. Because one of the things that I always ran into Python when I was pulling from APIs is if I, I pulled, you know, different dimensions and metrics and I tried to merge them, it wouldn't merge seamlessly because sometimes, you know, there weren't any you know, actual data in some of the columns, you know, Python's really rigid as far as the data frames go. And so this actually allows you to kind of go back and forth in between them. And I absolutely love it. It's like seamless. And so like here, I'm telling it to create a data frame called cars from the SAS data set. So it's kind of creating like a hybrid data frame slash SAS data set. So I get it to run. And so in, I don't know, since most everybody in here hasn't used SAS, the equivalent to describe in Python is proc means. And so you can actually tell it that you want to write SAS programming within this environment. I think this is called like calling like the magic code or the magic script, so to speak, and say, I want to actually write SAS syntax within this environment. So you can run the same equivalent to what you had with describe in SAS. So this gives you, and so you can see the difference between the output. This is how it looks in native SAS. It has this like HTML blue kind of feel to it, but then this is how it looks within Python. But it's exactly one-to-one. -one. This allows you, so like I had said, it allows you to read data from, you know, websites that are secure. And so this is actually taking a CSV and this person actually kind of created this whole example so that way people could kind of go around and play with it. And so we just use this read CSV um, function within pandas. And I apologize if I'm using the wrong terms. I'm still trying to translate appropriately between the two because I know that, you know, 
Python has data frames and SAS has data sets. And so I'm still trying to figure out the translation a little bit. But I will say, I'll show you an example where I find Python to be a lot more useful because there's a piece where I turn on the learn SAS mode and it shows you the Python script and then the SAS code is like probably like 15 additional lines of code. And so there are ways that Python is a lot more advantageous than SAS. So this is a really great way to kind of display that. So, you know, here it reads in the CSV. And so it, like literally you're coding in Python, but it's within a SAS environment. It's just, I'm still kind of coming to terms with it because it's not something that they've had before. And here, you, this is actually creating a SAS data set itself. So before, like I told you, it was kind of a hybrid. So you couldn't actually do all of the same things that you could on a SAS data set. This actually creates a, what, what SAS calls like kind of a working data set that you can use within the environment if you don't want to continue kind of calling the hybrid. So when you run that, you know, does the same thing, DF describe. And so this was just to show like, here's how the DF describe looks like when it's a Python data frame. This is how it looks like whenever you call that when it's a SAS data set. Literally, it's the same information, just structured just a little bit differently. And so, you know, this is again where I've utilized this a little bit to show web developers or application developers that, you know, we're doing a lot of the same work. It's just a matter of kind of translating it because a lot of times they would be developing databases for websites that I would need content from. So that way I could overlay it with Google Analytics or campaign information, but they didn't understand why I needed it out and they didn't know how to. And so I would try and write scripts for them to kind of say, hey, here's the equivalent in SAS, here's how I think you can do it in Python. And it was just a really great kind of uh, synergy between the two. And then you can actually run histograms. Again, this is a SAS data set. This is now, this isn't a Python data frame or a hybrid. It's a pure SAS data set, but you're writing Python code and running it against a SAS data set, which I think is just really neat in and of itself. Oh. Again, you can go back to running like pure SAS code and writing SAS syntax within it if you want. So, and I'll show you where you can actually get the same script in another example that I have put together because again, there's a mod mode that it has where you can turn on the teach me SAS. And this isn't to promote SAS by the way, because there's an other program I'll tell you guys about in a minute that is like a fraction of the cost of SAS that I personally use for like consulting on my free time. And yeah, it's pretty awesome. I like it. You write SAS syntax within, within it. They actually had this big lawsuit thing. It was kind of, you should read about it. It's kind of funny. So then you can take that data set and you can run actual SAS code on it. So you can literally switch between the two. You can go from Python to SAS code, whichever you feel comfortable in. So if you're actually working with like researchers or typical kind of analysts that utilize SAS, this is an environment where you can kind of create like coding examples or things of that nature so that way you can collaborate and go back and forth between them. This is where I've kind of found this to be really nice to utilize. Again, really working heavily with the de developers. I mean, I used to work with devs and they used to give me a hard time because they're like, I don't know why you need me to tag all this crap or why you need any of this information. And so this really gave us kind of a platform to kind of share and understand each other a little bit. And so. I found it incredibly helpful from that perspective. And so then, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with, uh, like, you know, the info uh, feature within pan, like Python, but then, you know, the equivalent in SAS is proc content. So it kind of gives you similar information, again, not within, doesn't look exactly the same, one's in HTML blue, but then here is the you know, Python equivalent. It's a lot cleaner, stacked, gives you just the core information that you need from it. Again, SAS has really great data sets that you guys can kind of like play around with to be able to pull in and test different pieces of code with. Um, I'm a really big baseball fan. Sabermetrics is one of my favorite things. <laughs> it's one of the reasons why I like 
to watch baseball. And so you can actually pull in, you know, a SAS data set, create that kind of hybrid data framed SAS data set to run. So I think it ran, and then you can run like the describe feature on it. Again, runs all the means and medians, same type of thing. Info, and this is just, and I can send you guys this, this um, Jupyter notebook so that you guys have it, like both of them, because I put together this example the other day because like, I wanted to try and like show everybody like kind of a sequence of here's how you can do things in Python versus SAS. And I just thought it was kind of neat. I was like, wow, this code really has so many similarities. Like, it, they're doing the exact same thing, just packaged just slightly differently. But here's where I started to run into snags with this program, right? So I wanted to sort the values and group them. It will not let me do it because it's that hybrid, right? So it's not a data frame. It's not really a data set. And so it's not allowing me to actually sort it or group them by it because it's not in that general data frame format. And so this was a little bit tricky to figure out how to create a SAS or a data frame from a SAS data set. So this program actually has this feature where they did a, what is it, DF to SDS. They kind of abbreviated it. They don't have the equivalent from going from a SAS data set to a data frame because they really didn't think anybody would want to do that. But I really wanted to be able to utilize Python code. And so I needed to create a Python data frame. So this allows you to do that. And so from there, now I can run all of the same. I can finally sort it, group it, sum it by, you know, the league, the team, the number of hits. The thing is, though, if I wanted to go back and use that SAS data set that was created, the problem that you have within certain data sets is that you have to have certain permissions. And so I was running into an issue where I didn't have the right permissions, and so it wouldn't actually let me run some of the, like, sorting. So in SAS, before you actually do any sort of grouping and things like that, you have to sort your data but I didn't have the right permissions, and so I had to actually create a separate working data set for it to work. Once I did that, oh, did it still not, still doesn't run, hold on. So then it actually ran it. And so there's, it's nice because this is how like the, so this is called like your SAS log. So it actually breaks it down piece by piece. Again, this environment literally allows you to go back and forth between the two. And this is very useful to me because I've been trying to learn Python for analytics and data mining purposes. I just found that Python data frames can be way too rigid at times for the data sets that I get primarily working in research because we would have participants that didn't have all of the same column headers and things of that nature. And so this allows me to go back and forth between the two. Um, I kind of dabble in data visualizations a little bit um, using d3.js sometimes. And so this really allows me to have that fluidity between using a kind of a data manipulation, data cleaning software that's really robust being able to pull it back into a web-based language and kind of create and manipulate and build some kind of web-based apps from it. So I will show you guys another example. So there is this feature within SAS, within this environment for SASB that is called Teach Me SAS. This is where I thought probably you guys may appreciate it if you guys haven't actually coded in SAS because I know I try always to look at what are the equivalent Python codes for my SAS code. You know, there's a lot of out there, but it literally just doesn't give it to me in real time. So if you guys have Python scripts that work perfectly and you want to know how do I write this equivalent in SAS, this allows you to see that in real time, which to me saves tons of time and research in a lot of ways. So I actually ran this earlier because I figured out that it doesn't always run depending on if you're running a SAS data set with Python code and vice versa. And so from here, you know, you just do the same exact import of SASB 
pandas and you start the SAS session and you just enable the true mode for Teach Me SAS. And so this actually shows you, like before, it gave you the output from it, right? And so now it actually shows you cars.describe is the equivalent of this, which I know is a lot more code. It's just a ton more lines. And so this can also be useful if you have, you know, I've, I always try and leverage um, using open source versus paying for something because it's more efficient. So this is a great way to say, you know, if we were to use SAS, we have to write all this code. If we use Python, it's just like this tiny little piece. So this really kind of shows you that. Now this is where it gets, uh, it doesn't always show you this, the SAS code because again, we are creating a data frame from it. So it doesn't have the equivalent to SAS because it's pure Python code. But here where you did probably, this is amazing to me. This is where I was saying you can write one little tiny snippet of code for Python. This is what you have to write in SAS to get the exact same information. It's, it amazed me when it ran. I just couldn't believe it that in order to get the exact same information, that's what I had to write. So I'm trying to get our group to move over to Python. They're big, heavy SAS or SPSS users. Anybody use SPSS? A lot of like psych departments, uh, behavioral sciences, academia uses it. Um, but honestly, Python's, I, I'm really becoming more and more of a Python champion the more I use it because I just find it so much more robust. And easy, I think the data, like the entry point to learning the code's a little bit simpler as well. Because like here, you only have to write to make the histogram. One line of code, to do it in SAS, you have to write what, one, two, three, four, five lines. You know, and this actually, so this creates the SAS data set, does the describe again, here's your info, shows how many lines it is, and I'm trying to, so this was funny. I found this hilarious. Too complicated to show the code. <laughs> Read the source and it makes a little happy face. <laughs> like, I thought that was so, I didn't realize they had that in there <laughs> until I was going through putting together this example and I was like, oh, I found a, a little Easter egg within there within their program, because this, again, it's open source that, you know, they want everybody to contribute to it. I actually found a bug while I was doing this because you're supposed to be able to disable the SAS teach me mode by putting um, sas.teachme sas false. It does not work. So I had to message it. And so the actual guy who start, who's, who developed this is looking into it to figure out why it doesn't work. I don't know why that hasn't been found because whenever I was going through this example, trying to actually see the Python code, what I had to do is here, you can see, I had to start over, like create a new SAS session in order to make it in a new environment so it didn't carry over the enabled SAS teach me mode. So it's a pretty decent sized bug because there's times where I wanna be able to run my code and if it works in Python, I'm gonna be, okay, what's the SAS equivalent? And I wanna do it in the same environment. I don't wanna to have to switch between notebooks just to see that. And so I'll let you guys know what they say because I was not expecting to find that large of a bug. And then you have, you know, again, you sort it. There's, this is, you know, writing Python code so there's no actual equivalent within SAS. And so there's nothing to really show when you have that enabled. But, you know, I really wanted to take everybody through kind of this example of how, from a data perspective, I mean, I've been a data analyst for like 12 years and I've used SAS, R, and now I'm migrating over to Python. And really what I've learned is that you have to combine them in some respects. Um, I find R to sometimes be a little bit easier to connect to some of the APIs and create like recurring scripts, but then I find Python to have so much more of a robust library of modules to choose from, like pandas, NumPy, things of that nature. And so. I'm still learning to try and pick and choose from the different places, but I really wanted to share this with you guys because I know you guys were primary Python coders and it just kind of gives you guys a nice way to learn or look at another language that is, you know, you can do the equivalent things within Python, but then also show, hey, maybe there's something I can do within SAS that takes me for, you know, a long time to do within Python. And that's where I was gonna tell you guys about, there's this really cool, um, company called World Programming Systems. It's kind of a thing that don't really talk to SAS like heavy users about this because they get really upset. But it is 
literally the equivalent to SAS. You can download it, and, they, and I wanted to make sure they had the equivalent to what we were just using, and they do. Like, you can write Python, you can write R, you can write SQL code, like everything. And it is a fraction of the cost. It's $1,200 a year, and that's it. I mean, I say that's it. I mean, I know $1,200 is still a lot, but if you're doing consulting and things like that, it's a lot cheaper price point than having to pay three to $9,000 for SaaS. And so they have a really great trial um, option where you have it for like 30 days and you can try it out. And so, again, you still have like this free university edition. It still works for the most part. You still have all the primary functions within SaaS. Um, there's a couple of additional things that you can do if you actually have like a local install of SaaS, but for the most part, you guys can download it for free, utilize it, test your code out, and learn SaaS within a Python environment, which I just thought was really, really neat and awesome. Other, like they have great documentation about it. They have like the different, like your API reference now. Not all Python libraries and functions are available within, you know, the SAS environment, like we saw, I couldn't do the group by, I couldn't sort using Python code. So there's some things that they don't necessarily have migrated over to it yet, but they have great documentation of it. Um, there was another thing, I haven't been able to look into it yet. It's called Pipe Fitter. So this is supposed to allow you to basically kind of create recurring like tasks, so to speak. And so they, created this, I haven't got a chance to use it yet. I plan on testing it out because from an analytic standpoint, I tend to have to rerun the same type of analysis over and over again. We're kind of cleaning aspects on our research data. So, you know, we get demographics. Um, I work in, with a primarily psychological group, so we get different scales of information. And so we have to adjust, test for missing, things of that nature. And so this is really neat to see as well. So I can share like these examples with you guys so you guys can actually see how they look and kind of test it yourself and share the various references that I've gone through and give you like some contact information as well. But I went through that a lot quicker than I expected to, by the way. But that's kind of where from, for me, for Python, for analytics, I found that you know, just kind of testing the code within SAS to Python, because I haven't been able to completely um, co coerce my group over to fully going open source yet, right? And they're like, well, SAS is tested, you know, we pay a lot of money for it, and it's worth the money because of X, Y, and Z. It's like, yeah, but when it comes to doing certain things, like the data cleaning and the modeling, I mean, really, models change all the time. The algorithms underneath, they discover new things every day. And so whenever you're able to show them that, hey, we can do the same things with this open source, you can give me that money, you're gonna spend on SaaS maybe, how about a raise? And so that's kind of where my journey has gone with Python and analytics is that I'm trying to migrate them over to more of the open source bracket. And I feel like SaaS actually coming up with this, while it was great for them, so that way I could code with them both, it's actually allowing me to <laughs> give a reason to my group why we should utilize Python. Again, pulling down from APIs is incredibly useful. Um, I don't get to do it as much because I'm not in advertising anymore, but you could scrape, like we do, we, we're trying to look at Reddit for sentiment analysis, so being able to scrape down comments, things of that nature. I use that example with the CSV file from GitHub. I mean, it's really neat what you can do with it, and so I just kind of wanted to really share that with you guys because I was gonna go a different direction, but when I, came, when I came across this a few months ago, I was like, no, I really wanna be able to show people this because I don't know if everybody's a, I love learning new languages, it's kind of my thing. Not like speaking languages, but coding languages. And so, since you guys probably haven't dabbled in it, I was like, ooh, they may like this. And so that's why I wanted to share it with you all. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. It's the, it's the primary language a lot of academic institutions use. Um, SPSS is also really popular. I would say SPSS is more heavily used in like the social sciences. 
Um, the reason why SAS is used in EPI is because there's also biostatisticians that were kind of in the same realm. And so we do a lot of, like biostatisticians do a lot of modeling, EPIs do the same thing. So the program I was a part of kind of taught you both, but that's why they kind of heavily went towards SAS because, you know, they're tested models, they go through this very lengthy process, and so that's why they kind of migrated towards SAS. Um, Oh yeah, I think hands down, I think it can. I think where people get hesitant is because of the open source part of it, but that doesn't necessarily scare me personally. I like the ability to share pieces of information. I keep finding bugs in SAS code all the time. I actually, do what? Oh, no, I actually found this bug, like I was using, they have a table of contents feature where you can create a table of contents from a report feature but I needed it to do hierarchical levels. And I found a bug to where I could insert what is considered by word a blank. And so whenever I imported the RTF file into Word and I ran, you know, there's, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but I ran it and it recognized those values as blank. So it did my hierarchical table of contents. You're not natively able to do that in SAS. It doesn't work in PDF because I don't know like the PDF equivalent of a missing. Again, it's just kind of this little bug that's in there. Um, it's kind of, I like to find bugs personally. I think it's kind of fun. Uh, I found one actually a few years ago where you could do repeated measures analysis with survey data, but you had to adjust the weight by including not only your weighting variable, but also your subgroups and you were able to do weighted measures analysis within SAS that they thought you could only do within Stata. But again, not a known documented method, and so, yeah, the SAS folks, sometimes they ask me to like test stuff for them, which is kind of, I'm like, as long as I get it free, <laughs> personally. But I think, I think things like Python, R, are gonna take over it, because SAS is, SAS doesn't have kind of the artistic capabilities of some of the open source languages, and plus, I'm, I love D3.js. I don't know if anybody's really used that very much. If you haven't, look into it. It's fantastic. I may be able to show you guys an example real quick, though. So this is where my husband's a developer, so we collaborate a lot. And so he actually, we, we collaborate on this. I did the data manipulation and organization in order to feed these visualizations, and he developed the programming to actually develop them. And so. This is something that, because um, he did his own thing for a while and we worked together, but this shows kind of the um, security controls for a company and he still uses this. We developed this like six years ago. He still uses this when he goes to trade shows. So it shows the complexities of all of the requirements from a security perspective for a tech company. And so you can control the tension so you can make it to where it's all crazy. You can control it to where it's kind of confined and then here's your control impact tree. And so you can go out to families and kind of bridge out from there. I mean, I see a lot of healthcare um, applications for this as well, different kind of diagnoses and potential outcomes from it. And so I'm trying to get my group to understand that we can leverage this from a public health standpoint and education. And so we're trying, but again, they, they kind of get stuck around if it, if they pay for it, then it's the value. As soon as you throw, oh, it's open source and everybody, yeah, it's like, oh, it's not valid. Unfortunately, I find it to be short-sighted, in my opinion. Does anybody? Do what? Mafazo, yeah, that's the, secure, that's the security company that we developed it for. Yeah. I think you can, yeah. It's a public accessible URL. It's pretty, yeah, it took us, it, it took a minute. Like the, the way you have to structure your data behind this is a huge problem. Cause I remember he was getting so frustrated and I was like, let me help you a little bit. <laughs> and I was like, you don't have to do this on your own because the, again, that's where I think the developer slash kind of data analyst relationship can really thrive. Um, I have personally loved it. I've, I wouldn't say I've converted but kind of several developers over to liking data and analytics because you know a lot of times they're like, man, I place these tags on there, nobody uses it, nobody shows me the value. Um, 
we would actually work with our developers, especially on the front end, and place UX driven kind of tags on there. And when we would get a website for a redesign, we would tag everything on the current site and say, let's do data driven decision making. And of course, they were like, oh, no, no, it's not worth it. Nobody using this feature. Come to find out the feature we were going to take away, everybody liked, like all of the end users used. And so that's where it's like, we have to make sure we tag and track things and utilize the data from our audience perspective, not our kind of technical side, because it's very different. And so we've really, you know, we utilize that. He'll actually, Terry's supposed to, that's my husband, by the way, sorry. I talk about him like he's here. He will be talking, because we started a, a separate group, OKC Analytics, that kind of has not only our, my wonderful friend Rebecca from a digital marketing and advertising perspective, myself from just general data and analytics, we have social media, um, as well as a UX research and design expert. She's actually written many books, Susan Simpkins, I don't know if anybody's heard of her, but she's one of my favorite people. But he's actually gonna talk about, you know, kind of tagging and tracking a website and do kind of a live demo of, here's how you can add all these different data attributes and go over like the naming scheme of it and so how you can kind of streamline that process and eventually we're actually gonna do like a whole data visualization kind of talk because we were in the middle, we've got it part of the way developed to where we were pulling down in real time Google Analytics data and having a dashboard populate because of course execs love, you know, pretty pictures, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it was just kind of a funny, I was, yeah. And that's how you, that's how we were able to automate, like when we looked at different websites, like reports of how things were going, because we tagged them all the same. So in, I don't know if anybody's really used Google Analytics heavily here. Event tracking is a big thing. Um, there's a lot of custom tracking you do. We actually, I did a talk on this at the last OKC Analytics group. Um, I think I can share the, the PDF, but it actually went through adding um, some additional kind of enhanced data tracking to it so you can get page visibility. Um, so you can tell, I used to work for an advertising agency that does the NRA. Um, so I had to do all kinds of sentiment analysis, analytics tracking, um, article reading, and so we actually went through and we would tag a site based off of scroll depth and timing of how long it took because they were like, oh, somebody made it 100% of the way down, but when we would look at the timestamp, it's like it took them two seconds versus when we would look at people that would take at least you know a minute or two and actually say, hey, when you guys develop this content, how long do you think an average reader is gonna take? It's amazing how when you actually start talking to individuals who develop it and you kind of try to get data out of them, they're like, well, I don't, I don't know. You might wanna, yeah, at the same pace. So, yeah, so it's, it's really neat. So he, he'll actually kind of go through like different ways that we kind of track sites. There's, I don't know if anybody, it's not PWIC anymore. Hold on, what's it called? Not PWIC, it's not PWIC. They changed their name, Matomo. Has anybody heard of this? So this is actually what a lot of um, hospitals and healthcare um, facilities will use instead of Google Analytics because it's a self-hosted solution. So you can control the security around it. It's amazing. I absolutely love it. You get IP addresses, you get user and behavior flows, all kinds of things. But there is a way you can push the client ID and session ID from Google Analytics over to Matomo, I'm sorry, it's a weird name. I like Pewit better. Sounds like 
like the people that do the genetic stuff for plants. But this is a really cool program. Like you can actually supplement it. So he'll kind of go over to at one point how you can add Google Analytics because everybody wants Google Analytics, right? I mean, it's the standard kind of like how SaaS can be. But I really do think everybody's going to go towards more open source. And so we'll actually kind of go over tra tagging and tracking and display how data looks within this interface versus Google Analytics at one point as well. So. I think he's going to do part of it in April and probably part of it in June. He's going to kind of break it. April 2nd at 6.30? Yes, it's the first one. And then the next one will be in June. June I don't know what the first Monday in June is. Oh, was there a slide? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I don't pay attention. <laughs> but yeah, this is, this is really neat. Like, I'll, I can send you guys the talk that we did last time because it kind of gives examples and sources. Um, that's one cool thing is that we were able to find a lot of code that already existed to add it via Google Tag Manager. Anybody use that here? I know, you, yeah, Tag Manager, it's, it's pretty neat. You can add some of the, the extra tracking for it, so. I can share that with you guys too. You guys want to dabble in it? Yeah, this is my favorite. I love this. I think data visualizations are the data storytelling is kind of that big thing that everybody's talking about right now. Um, it's kind of the way people are going. It's not really giving like these stagnant images. They want to see moving interactive um, graphics. And so trying to set up a realistic expectation that it takes a little bit longer to make these than a stagnant bar graph. But, you know. You know what it's like. It takes a while to convince people. Does anybody else have any questions? Thank you, guys. So I was totally serious about that pie. Like, really pie. Oh my God, there's really pie. And so this guy's uh, apparently trying to start up a food truck. And at least the peanut butter cup pie is really amazing. I couldn't go for the second one because, oh my God, that's a lot of sugar, but it's yummy. Um, yeah, it looks like somebody's pulling up the, uh, there, there you go. So uh, thanks for coming out. Get some pie. Um, I don't know. If, do they want feedback on the pie? Probably not. It's, it's super yummy. I don't know that it needs a lot of feedback, but... Um, we'll be back again next month for lightning talks. So like at least 30% of you need to sign up for lightning talks. So we have some attrition available, especially you, Aaron. Come on. Like, I know you can do something. So uh, we'll see you again in four weeks-ish. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>